Over here in Revelation chapter 12, and if you've been with us, we're moving right through the book of Revelation, and I can't encourage you enough, you know, have your own Bible, bring it with you, bring it with you to work, have it with you in the car, obviously put it next to your bed at night, read it when you wake up in the morning, read it before you go to bed at night. Psalm chapter 1 tells us that the man who is happy the man who is blessed, the man who is, who is filled and content is the man who is meditating. And that word meditate simply means to think on God's word. That's it. So you got to get God's word in you to think on it. In Acts chapter 2, Paul the apostle was there, uh, Peter was there for the day of Pentecost. And when the Holy Spirit came upon Peter, he shared the word and 3,000 souls were saved. But don't misunderstand this. Peter had taken the word and put it in him, and that's what the Holy Spirit was able to, to grab a hold of and put together and use to bring the gospel to, to those people and allow Peter to open the door for those 3,000 to be saved. And that's what we're doing here. Uh, we're studying the book of Revelation. The word revelation, the title, the title to this book is actually the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this, this word, uh, the word for revelation, I hope you remember it. What is the word for revelation in the Greek? Hopefully you said apocalypsis. Apocalypsis. In our world, when they talk about the end of time, they say it's the apocalypse. And they kind of sensationalize these things, the culture. And the reason why they sensationalize them is so that you wouldn't look into them. So you wouldn't begin to realize the book of Revelation is not a hard book to understand. Apocalypse simply means the unveiling. And here in Revelation, Jesus Christ is unveiling for us what is going to happen after these things. Now, hopefully by now, you know the divine outline. You know the progress of Revelation. If you don't, you should. You should. You should know these things. It's important. The things which you have seen, the resurrected Christ, the things which are there in Revelation 119, the things which are, which is the church. We're in the church age right now, Revelation 2 and 3, and the things which will take place after these things. Meta tauta is the Greek word. And that begins in chapter 4 and 5, the rapture of the church. We're going to be in heaven with Jesus. And then chapter 6 through 19 is God pouring out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. And we pick it up. We've looked at the seven seal judgments already. God has already begun to pour judgment on this world. We've looked at the seven trumpet judgments. And now in chapter 12, we saw this picture of Satan opposing Israel at the birth of Christ. And Satan has always opposed God's people. We pick it up, verse 7. It says, And war broke out in heaven. And this right now is a vision, not really sequ sequential in the seven-year tribulation. This is now John having a vision of what happened, how Satan was thrown out of heaven. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels, it says, fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. The dragon is Lucifer, Satan. Verse 8, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon the enemy, Satan himself, the accuser of the brethren, the one that Peter refers to as being sober. We need to be sober. We need to be vigilant. For our adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. He's a, he's a, a bully. He's an intimidator. He wants to shout in your face and get you scared so that you listen to whatever he says. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the world. Listen, if you have your pen, you could circle that word deceives. That's primarily what Satan does. Satan gets us to believe things that are not true as if they were true and then to act on them. That's how he hurts us. He gets us to believe things that are not true as if they were true and then he gets us to act on them. When we do that, it causes destruction. And it is sin. It really is. That's why reading your Bible, being in the Word, gathering together, right, as the church, the church, word church, ecclesia, the called out assembly, that's why gathering together and hearing the Word is so important because when we hear the Word, it destroys the deceptive tactics of the enemy. It blows up his plans. It circumvents his schemes. It causes us right before we're about to step into a, to a, a satanic trap to go, wait a second, 
I'm not going to step there. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say those things. I'm not going to think that way. I'm not going to have that pride or, you know, say that uh, slander or gossip about those people or that person. And Satan deceives the whole world. Right now, Satan's deceptive. He's deceiving the world. You know, man right now does not understand uh, that what God's word says is sin is sin indeed. And that all of the nations, listen, all the nations, so the governors, the mayors, the county executives, you know, the senators, uh, those on the more national level from the president, the vice president, the senators, uh, the congressmen and women, you know, we may right now be under their authority as a nation, but there will be a day where you and I will stand before God and there will be a day where those, those politicians will also stand individually before the one true judge, the true and living God. And don't be deceived from that, right? The Bible tells us in Hebrews that it's been appointed unto man once to die, and after that death, there is judgment. We're gonna receive judgment. Those who are Christians, we will not be judged you know, to salvation because, because Jesus Christ has taken our place, but, but we'll be judged for what we've done for Christ, right? What we've done with the motivation to serve the Lord. Those that have decided to reject Jesus Christ and what he did for on the cross will then stand before God based on their own merits. And what they're gonna discover is the, the law that God uses is his word, right? So something like abortion in this age, that man says, well, it's not so bad. It's permissible. It's a woman's right to choose. God is gonna say, well, no, I created that baby in your womb. You know, maybe biologically you were a part of forming that baby, but I was the one that gave that baby life. I'm the one that formed that child in your womb. I'm the one that gave that person, you know, a personality. And after that abortion, I'm the one that took them to heaven. But you performing that act, now there's consequences attached to it. And don't be deceived. Uh, that's how it works. But Satan deceives the whole world. It says he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Uh, a third of the angels you know, were cast out of heaven with Satan. That became the demonic realm that Paul speaks of in Ephesians chapter six, that we wrestle not against other human beings, against flesh and blood, but it's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle against principalities, powers, the rulers of this age, the spiritual hosts, uh, host in the Bible is angels, the spiritual spirits, hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. They were cast out with Satan. And look what it says here, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast out. And that's what Satan does. He accuses us. He makes accusations. He wants you to believe that God thinks things about you that God does not think about you. And he accuses you. He wants to get other people to throw out accusations, unfounded things. You wanna know how to determine whether something's an accusation? If somebody actually is concerned about something going on in your life, and they're concerned about it to a place where it's motivated by love and care, what are they going to do? What they're gonna do is they're gonna to come to you personally. They're gonna to come to you privately. They're gonna say, brother, sister, there's this situation going on. I'm confused about this, this, this thing. I have a question for you. Can we talk? If they don't do that, but they go and they tell others, they have now, they are being used by the enemy because that's what the enemy is. He is the accuser of the brethren. So two things as we close the devotion. Number one, don't accuse others, right? Don't let the enemy use you for his plans and his purposes, Jesus said, you know, that they shall know us by our love for one another, right? Paul said in Romans, oh, no one anything but to love them, right? To love them, number one. Number two, when the enemy throws accusations into your mind, which is inevitable, he's gonna throw thoughts at you. He's going to try to uh, pin, you know, sins to your life. Just lift them right up to Jesus. Say, Lord, the enemy's attacking. He's throwing thoughts at me. He's accusing me. Father, remind me that my sins have been paid for by your son, Jesus. 
and just be blessed in that today, knowing your sins have been forgiven. So let's pray. Father, today we do thank you that in your word, Lord, even in the book of Revelation, you tell us, Lord, Satan is a deceiver and he's also an accuser. And God, we pray that we would not make the same mistakes as others. Lord, those examples we see in the pages of scripture of those who allowed themselves to walk in the flesh and Lord, found themselves cooperating and even being used by Satan himself to attack your people. Lord, help us not to do that. Lord, help us to walk in love. Your word says they'll know we are your disciples by our love for each other. And your word says that we owe others love, Lord. We owe them love. So Lord, convict us by your spirit of these things and help us to walk in love, we pray. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen.